Probably better than, better than anything I could possibly say is we could just reread what Kathleen read from Corinthians, and it kind of encapsulates the whole essence of the gospel. You know, today, so we're hearing a, a reaction, a response to Jesus speaking in the synagogue. Now, if we recall two weeks ago before the snowstorm, uh, Jesus is reading from Isaiah chapter 61 that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has called me to set the, the captives free, to give sight to the blind, to be able to uh, have the leopards walk, to cure these people. Now, this was all the prophecy that the Jewish people believed from the prophet Isaiah was the foretelling of the Messiah. So when Jesus says, in your hearing, Scripture is fulfilled, he's essentially saying that I am the Messiah, and they got all angry and were ready to throw him off the side of the hill. So they had this reaction, this response to Jesus. There's a lot of responses to Jesus, isn't there? A lot of us, every one of us has a response to Jesus and to who Jesus is and who Jesus is in our lives. We all have a response. You know, as um during the snowstorm, I was watching The Godfather. And, uh, you know, you see, by the way, I was talking to Terry, Deacon Terry, about a little bit of this. And I said to him, I said, you know, The Godfather. He goes, oh, I've never seen The Godfather. I was like, what? You've never seen The Godfather? And he goes, no, I've never seen The Godfather. I go, Terry, that's like saying I've never been to Disney World. And he goes, I've never been to Disney World. <laughs> have you been to Disney World? Yes. You've told Terry about it, right? Well, we show him all of it. <laughs> I was like, "Say, Terry, you and Brian got to go to Disney World." They're like, I can, can you see you, you and you have to imagine Brian and Terry walking around Disney World. What is it? Uh, what's the what's the uh, with the with the mouse ears having a little ice cream, walking through and seeing the castle there. And it's kind of funny, I guess the castle is an interesting thing, right? Because the castle, you look at the castle and it's this beautiful, magnificent building. And yet, really nobody lives in the castle. The castle is, is empty. And so often that could be even when you look at like people's response to Jesus, right? You know, back to the Godfather, where you have... Clemens is like taking these guns, handing them to, to uh, Vito and through the window. And then later on, they're stealing a carpet and then they're sitting there having a bowl of pasta. And here's Clemenza <laughs> before he has his bowl of pasta. You know what I mean? And remember that scene where they're all got the statue of the Blessed Mother all pinning dollar bills on her and everything like that. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah. I remember as a, as a young priest doing a wake, or, and uh, some guys would come to me and go, you know, Father, I just want you to know something. Every time I pass by a church, I bust myself. <laughs> I'm like, you're blowing me away with your spirituality, you know? You bless yourself every time you pass. <laughs> or uh, I had a, a girlfriend in high school, her mother, great lady, uh, but she would go to church, and then what she would do was every Palm Sunday... She would take the palm from that she got on Sunday, and she would take the old palm out, you know, the crucifix, and then there would be like a little room there between the arm and the wood, and she would take that palm out and then slide the new palm in there and have that on the wall. Like, what? Like, what does that mean? I can remember even years ago, we would be here, we'd be like waving the palm and have the procession come up and... I'm waving the palm, I'm, you know, everybody's doing it, and all of a sudden I'm like kind of looking at my arm going, I'm like, what are you doing? Waving this palm, what do we do? You know, and it's like you come home, I got, I got extra palm. What am I supposed to do with it? Find 14 crucifixes and shove the palms. So there's a lot of different responses to, to Jesus. You know, when you really look at it, there's a lot of it could be very, it could be very a superficial thing. It could be like this Disney castle, but nobody's home. It's, it's like, I believe in Jesus. I have lots of friends. I'm sure you have lots of friends. 
I went through Catholic school my whole entire life. I have friends I've known since I'm five years old. And it, it means nothing to them, really. It's like, how do, you, how do you hear this Jesus? How do you hear about this? And just like, there's just, I guess no response is a response. Right? You know, we, we, we see that so often. And then you can even see when you, even in, in, in religion, you can see how uh, that can become. Donna, you had sent me a, a little article and it was talking how like, all religion starts out of mysticism. There's a, there's a fire to it. There's an aliveness to it. Like it's almost like a volcano, like lava coming out, this hot, live lava. But then as it comes over, it gets hardened and gets crusted and becomes almost deadening. You know, almost like sometimes like religion can get, we can get lost in the external trappings of things, you know, where they have like, they get focused on how much wax is in the candle or the color of the vestments or what the liturgical calendar is and the different readings. And those are all well and good, right? But, but it's got to be underneath all of that is how does any of this really lend itself towards this experience, this alive experience of Jesus in our life? so external, so it's almost like deadening. You know, the research is lately that organized religion is down almost 35% in attendance, you know? And I think to myself, my God, can you imagine, can you imagine walk, driving around Tom's River or whatever town and there's no churches Right? And just get rid of all the churches and turn them into condos or office buildings or restaurants or something like that. What would it be like? What, what's, what's, what's happening in terms of this response and this uh, how Christ, how Jesus occurs for people? We hear this in this passage today. They're getting so angry. Jesus is saying something that they don't want to believe, they don't want to hear, they don't want to consider it. So then yesterday, I watched five hours of Jesus of Nazareth. Have you ever seen that DeFranco Zeffirelli, Jesus of Nazareth? Oh my, you've got to watch that. That's like, that's like a retreat in and of itself. And, you know, I'm watching this and I'm saying to myself, like, wow, the, the power that was going on there, you know, in that movie, all those people, they all wanted to be a part of it. Anne Bancroft, James Ferentino, Ernest Borgnine, everybody, they had to be a part of that movie. And I was watching the movie and I'm thinking like with Peter was played by James Ferentino. It was so, he played it so beautifully. Who do you say that I am? I say you're the Messiah. The son of the living God. And I want to say to James Farentino, after you did that movie, or Robert Powell, after you played Jesus, how did that affect you in your life? You played it so beautifully. Were you just playing a role? Or did it penetrate your heart? Did it permeate your heart? You know, what was it about this Jesus that there's a Roman historian, Tacticus, and he writes this in the first century. There was a movement in Judea. Its founder was executed under Pontius Pilate. But the movement, instead of stopping, has now reached Rome itself. Roman historian. Why did it stop? <laughs> brutally, brutally crucified. Like a common criminal. Like a big nothing. Crucified. Tortured, laying dead, all of his followers scatter. What do you think? 
why didn't the movement end? He's dead. He's gone. But the movement didn't end. Why didn't they quit? Why didn't they stop? Why was their saying over and over again, this unbroken, abiding presence that they experienced after his death. What was that? Wow. And that, that that's no different today than it was 2,000 years ago. Why were those people so alive in their mind, in their heart, after the crucifixion, the execution of this man, Jesus. Why did it continue? How did it continue? How did they have the courage? How did they have the vibrancy and the love in their heart? How did they do that? How was in Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas refers, always refers the living Jesus living Jesus, this abiding, unbroken, empowering presence that was in those people. Those people. No different than us 2,000 years ago. Were they able to recall when Jesus said to them, Blessed are the pure of heart. You will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, people who are peacemakers. They're called the children of God. You want to be first? You got to be last. You want to be great? You got to love. You got to serve. You got to drop your ego. Did they, were they able to take that all into their heart? They listened to this message of Jesus. If you see me, you see the living God. And I love this where he says in the, in the Jesus of Nazareth, he's breaking the bread. This is the bread of life. This is the bread of life. We're about to receive the bread of life. The bread that gives life, that helps us to come alive, that deepens us. There's a scene there where John is talking to Jesus and he's going, he's just meeting Jesus. He's going, he goes like the, the law is on stone. It doesn't do anything. He goes, there's got to be something. There's got to be something more than just being born and dying. There's got to be something in between birth and death. Yeah, it's called life. It's called coming alive in Christ Jesus. It's living in the deepest dimension of who we are, this Jesus Christ, the song that you played, Joe, to love beyond what we could love. This love of Christ gives us this ability to love beyond what we can love. This mind of God gives us an intelligence beyond our human intelligence. There's a power that's operative in our lives that transforms us. This is what is operative in this Jesus. Do you know that your heart beats 100,000 times a day? Do you know that they don't even know why it beats? They can tell you the heart and the arteries and this and that and the blood and everything like that. 
but they cannot tell you what is it that keeps the heart pumping. Why does the heart pump? What is this thing called aliveness? Life. What is life? Why are we alive? What is the spark of life? The spark of life is the living God in us, through us. You eat food. You don't digest your food. You have a thing that's called the digestive system that is so brilliant, so beyond our, even our understanding, and it just digests our food and we just take it for granted. This is brilliant. This is brilliance inside of us. Your heart pumping, your digestive system, your consciousness, your ability to perceive, all of these things. This is all from the living God. And we're constantly having this. It's there for us all the time. The other day, you ever do this? I'm looking for my phone and I can't find my phone. And I'm like, I know I left my phone in the bedroom or no, 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 it was in the car. No, 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 it was in the kitchen. So I'm looking around, looking around. Hmm. My phone was two feet away from me on the other side of the couch. It was there, but I didn't see it because I was convinced in my mind that it was someplace else. Is that also true with the spirit of Jesus Christ? It's all around us. This kingdom within us, this power, this ability, it's always there. We have to look, we have to see, we have to believe, believe. Jesus says, don't try to see with your mind, don't even see with your eyes. See with your heart. And you'll see. Believe in your heart. He said, seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. You want to see it? You got to believe it. You got to know it. What did these people know 2,000 years ago? Think about it. The brutality of this guy being crucified. They were there. They ate with him. They walked with him. They listened to him. And he was gone. But something happened in their heart and their mind that he was alive. He was the living Jesus. Always present, unbroken, abiding presence. And they knew it. And they lived it. And it changed their life forever. They weren't going to quit. Because they had this living presence inside. So we have all these different responses to Jesus. Clemenza. Palms on the side. And we have this response from this early community, this living, abiding presence in their life that empowered them and transformed them. What is your response? <laughs> 